the RSI indicator. Does it work? Can it make you consistently profitable? These are the questions we're going to answer right now. Here's Andrew Foldy with Former Financial. Hey everyone, Andrew Faldi here, and I'm very excited about what we're going to be talking about today. So let's hop right into it. So today, at the end of this, by the end of this, actually it's quite early on, you're going to see a step-by-step -step and exact plan for trading RSI that has worked for over 50 years. I'm not going to just show you three examples or the last year or a couple good scenarios that would have worked if you had participated. I'm going to show you the sum total results of a specific plan that you can follow and the results over 50 years. All right, it's a lot of good data. But first, before we get into that, I want to talk to you about what is it? All right, what is the RSI? We're going to do this real quick. Wells Wilder Jr. in 1978 created the RSI. And the part I want to focus on is the confusing part. And it, uh, it means relative strength index. But what was it relative to? Relative to what? So the relative strength is not related to what some people may think of, which is comparing one asset to another, but it's actually the relative strength of up moves versus down moves. Okay, so it's actually just relative to itself. It's an internal look at itself comparing strength and weakness. All right, so when the asset price is weak, the RSI is going down. When the asset price is strong, the RSI is going up simple right and when it's in the middle this is a key part when it's in the middle at 50 then that means price is balanced that means the up moves and down moves are equaling out and in, in balance okay so there's it's a, a balance indicator it's a, a strength and weakness indicator and on the standard indicator you'll find two levels are shown that's overbought oversold often you'll see the default is 70 and 30. It's 70 or above, it's called overbought. It's 30 or below, it's called oversold. But there's a little bit of a problem. Have you ever seen something that was quote unquote oversold and so you bought it and you found out shortly after that that oversold could really lead to a lot lower prices? And have you ever bought or so I'm sorry, sold something because it was quote unquote overbought it was too high and then you found out shortly after that that it can just go up even more so that leaves us a little bit of a problem so we see a lot of stuff going on here <clears throat> there's strength there's weakness it's measuring strength and weakness it's showing us speed when price is moving down quickly that weakness is outweighing the strength and then we get these levels of overbought and oversold so the question is what are we supposed to do with all of this information in this one little indicator and that's what I want to explain to you and I want to show you when to buy and sell using the RSI and I'm not going to just tell you a dozen different ways and show you these um, interpretive ways where you can kind of go out and, and kind of get used to it and trade it your way I'm just going to show you a definitive precise way that controls risk and makes money and after that I want to talk about which time frames to use for the best returns Okay, so we'll focus on a daily time frame first, and then after I show you the best way to use it on the daily time frame, we'll actually dig into which time frames will give you better results. So I'm actually going to show you right now three different ways to trade the RSI, and in my opinion, really, statistically, which one's best. So the standard version is to buy when it crosses from oversold back into not oversold anymore. That's the standard version. And when it gets into overbought and then crosses back out, you sell. Very simple. All right. And so we're going to buy when the RSI crosses above 30. We're going to sell when it crosses below 70. It might be even valuable if I just briefly draw that out. Okay. So if that's 70 and that's 30, this is 50. And if the RSI gets oversold, Okay, we don't want, like we saw, we don't want to just buy because of that. We want it to actually come back out. All right, so when it crosses back above 30, that's our buy. And then we're going to hang on to it for whatever happens all the way up here. When it gets to over 70, we're not going to sell just because it's overbought. We're going to wait till it crosses back under. So this is going to be your sell. All right, nice and simple. Okay, so the results of that, and we're going to use the S&P 500. 
and we're going to look at about 60 years of data. I think it's like 59 and a half years. And it's the daily RSI, no changes, just the absolute default indicator. The cumulative annualized gross or uh, uh, yeah, gro growth rate is what that's called, the CAGR, is a whopping 2.32%. So that's why I call this not great. All right. Now, does it mean it's not great completely? Not necessarily. The good news is the default indicator on a broad index works. But I want to show you next what I think is more valuable. And we're going to just flip it around. Instead of using 30 to buy and 70 to sell, we're actually going to flip it upside down. Not completely, but mostly. And what we're going to do is we're going to buy, actually, when the RSI crisis above 70 and sell when it crosses below 30. So that's really simple. Same deal. <clears throat> when the RSI crosses above 70, that's actually going to be our buy signal. And we're going to hold on to that bad boy until no matter what happens all over the place, when it finally gets below 30, then we'll sell. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. You already see the equity curve from it. Same market, same settings, and we double our return to a whopping four. Yep, you would be better off just buying and holding the market. A little better risk control. You are kind of, you are not kind of, you're avoiding a lot of massive sell-offs, but you're giving up on just some gross returns. So it's better, but still not super exciting, right? And we're going to make this better still. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to speed this bad boy up. How's, how are we going to do that? We're going to just use the 50. So we're actually going to ignore 70, 30, and we're just going to use the 50. And as soon as the balance has shifted to strength, we're going to buy. And we're going to let it do whatever it wants to do on that side. And when it crosses below 50, we're going to sell. Okay. And we see already that the total return is going to be higher. And let's see what that comes out to. Market, same market, same settings. No, I'm not into Optimus. I don't like optimizing and re-optimizing all these different settings and things like that let's keep it simple if we can get good results from simple settings then we have something robust all right so where are we at better better still but not super exciting yet i'm going to tell you though stick around because it's going to get exciting we're just not there yet next what i'm going to show you so that was just the most basic look the absolute most basic look at the indicator on the most popular index for trading in the world just about the s p 500 and we used the standard settings and then we flipped the settings and then we used the other line the middle line and we see that all three work that's good news and we saw that we can make it a little bit better just by speeding it up and using it as a momentum indicator but the next thing i want to show you is can a different time frame give us better returns is it ju why just use the daily can something a little faster give us the better return. And then after I share that with you, I'm going to share with you what I believe is the single most important thing about using RSI to get those great returns, the best possible returns. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to speed things up. Everything's the same as our last study, 50 across both 50 buy, across both 50 sell on the S&P 500 with a 14 period look back. Everything's standard. No optimization here we finally get something respectable. What's respectable? Basically, slightly beating the market with a lot less drawdown. And so the market returned uh, during that same period of time. Now we're in 29 years instead of 50 or 60, by the way. So if you see that the total dollar returns is lower, well, we're actually cutting the time nearly in half, okay, right around in half. So ignore that, but looking smaller, and this is actually a lot more growth here. So this is a growth of 10,000 over that period of time at 8.94 and we're using CAGR as a, a, a compounding effect. It's very important to use compounding. I've, sh I've shifted a little bit around on that over the years. I used to not want to look at compounding. Then I realized to look at apples to apples, if you're going to invest and you're going to analyze the results of investing, which is self compounding, you leave the money in it compounds, then you should allow your trading to compound. That's the point of it, right? So we are using CAGR for that apples to apples look. Well, the market did 7.82% on average during that same time. So we've actually beat the market. More importantly, I can't drive this home enough. If you're familiar with me, you already know I emphasize this a lot. If you're not familiar with me, hello, nice to meet you. What I like to emphasize just as much as returns are drawdowns. The drawdown is 20%. Does that sound big? Well, it's actually not that bad because investing in the market would have given you a 55 over 55% drawdown 
with less return. So we have actually now, just by speeding things up with the standard settings of the indicator, we have the 50-50, we have crossing the 50 and crossing below the 50, that's our signal instead of the 70 and 30, and standard settings, major popular index, zero optimization, we've now shown that we can beat the market with less than half of the drawdown. Respectable, still not exciting, but respectable. Now let's speed it up some more. Let's go to the half hour chart, 30 minute charts. Same, 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 no changes, except we're just looking at faster data. Now we've bumped it up some more. We're at 11 and a half percent. The largest drawdown is a little larger. All right, so a little more return, a little larger drawdown, still significantly better than the market. Then I'm going to show you this final one where it's like, well, if speeding it up gets better and better and better. We sped up the indicator, then we sped up the time frame, then we sped up the time frame again, and it keeps getting better and better. Well, let's just drive it all the way down to a five minute chart. And I call this one too good because it literally is too good to be true. And what you'll, you're probably not used to hearing somebody share that with you. They show you amazing results and they get excited about it. I can tell you from my professional, I've been a funded trader, I've traded automated systems and options and prop firms and hedge funds, I've done it all. And I know what it's like to find amazing theoretical results that just don't work in the real world. So this is really, really exciting. You'll see the graph actually looks a little different. Uh, I actually had to have a, a, a friend of mine, a, a, one of our team members at Forma Financial, he had to write Python script to process this chart because there's so many data points. There's nearly 30,000 trades. That's one of the problems, but all the same settings, except on a five minute chart. We're up to 26% with, however, a bigger drawdown. So much bigger drawdown, much bigger returns. And I'm just going to give you a flat out warning before you leave this video and go set up the RSI and five minute chart and start trading it. Do not do it. I will show you how to get the higher returns with the lower drawdowns, but don't do it this way. The five minute chart in the S&P 500, the drawdown is ridiculous. So 62% drawdown is, you can't survive that. You cannot continue to trade that. When you lose that much, you can't climb back fast enough. All right. Secondly, slippage would destroy these results. All right. Everything after this, I'm going to actually include slippage in all the studies after this. I have not done it for this because bottom line, we don't need to use the S&P 500 for this indicator. So the next thing I want to do is show you, as I told you, the single most important thing about using RSI. You may have caught the hints already to get those higher returns that are actually achievable. We, sh we saw incremental, we saw unattractive results, we got it better. Notice everything's been positive. Every single thing's been positive so far, and we made it better and better and better and better until we got it so good that actually it's just not achievable because you would be over trading and get burned up on slippage. But you can get those higher returns. In fact, I think even better. In fact, not just I think, I know from experience, you can get better returns and actually experience them in the real world. After that, I'm going to share with you the number one way for you to be more consistently profitable. It may sound like the same thing. It's very different. I'm going to show you how to get larger returns. Okay. That can actually be achieved. And then sometimes you get large returns, but it's because you have one or two great trades a year or you had one great year and the rest were kind of average, or you lose some money some years and you have some really great years. What I'm talking about is first I'm going to show you how to get the larger returns. Then I'm going to show you how to make it more consistent from year to year, from month to month, even week to week. Okay. So first, the single most important thing about using RSI for the higher returns is market selection. If you caught the hint earlier, good for you. We're going to talk about market selection. Now, I want you to like take a picture, take a screenshot. If you're like on a laptop or a computer and you have your phone, like take a, a, an actual picture of these next couple of slides <clears throat> or write them down or whatever, because what I'm about to tell you will help you avoid one of the biggest mistakes that traders make in the markets. Okay. <clears throat> these are mistakes I've made and learned from, had to pay the price for it, and I would like you to avoid it. <clears throat> here it is. This is number one. Burn this into your brain. It's kind of long. I want you to think, think, read this and think and let this sink in. The S&P 500 moves about 8% on average <clears throat> each year. <clears throat> so it's very hard to squeeze out 
large returns out of a market that moves very little. You catching that? People are trading the E-minis, the SPY, S&P 500 options. They're doing all these trades and trading systems and strategies and analyzing and drawing lines and putting indicators on this big index, the S&P 500, to try to generate massive returns, whatever you determine is massive. Is your idea of massive 10% because you beat the market? Or is it 20 or 40 or 50 or 100 or 200%? How in the world do you think that looking at a market that only moves 8% on average will generate an opportunity for large returns? I made the mistake too. And you know what? You can do it, but you do it through massive amounts of risk and leverage. So what I suggest is, and this is slide number two, for you to burn this in and get this in, down so you can move forward with better results without the high risk. If you want to earn more from trading and investing, you need to follow markets that make bigger moves. It's a really simple idea, but a lot of people are afraid to do it. They like the safety of the big diversified index. They like the safety of use trading the thing that everyone talks about, the one that has the most volume, the one that's most liquid. Okay. And all those things that make it attractive for you to trade it is what drives you into a market that has very little opportunity to start with. So let me show you, rather than just giving you the concept and the theory, let me just prove it to you. Ready? Here's Apple. Why not? Let's start with Apple. Everybody does so that we can do it too. So it's same exact strategy, no changes at all, except I am going to go and throw a slippage in here. If I didn't, the results would be better, but I like to make sure we include that. So I got penny slippage in here. That, if you're not familiar, is just the difference between what the signal shows and where you probably would actually get filled. Some people only use half a cent. I like to use a full penny on a good liquid market. So, and by the way, it's actually worse because they've split the price um, over the years. So I, it actually wouldn't, it would be better than what's shown because the penny slippage uh, in hindsight with the split adjusted price actually is showing a bigger drag than you would actually see. I just look at that as a even more conservative look. If you have no clue what I just said, just know these are very conservative results. The cumulative, I always get that wrong, cumulative annualized growth rate or cumulative annual growth rate, okay? 26%. Solid, solid. With penny slippage, it was higher without. And the largest drawdown is 42%. Still large drawdown. So at that level of drawdown, what I just call this is not leverageable. In fact, I, it's not, not something you can do at large size altogether. But since it has four times the return of the S&P 500 RSI strategy on the same time frame, but it only has two times the return, to a drawdown, I mean, four times the return, only double the drawdown. What does that mean? You can trade half the size for the same drawdown and double the return. If you get four times the return with half the drawdown, or not half, but only two times the drawdown, you can cut the whole trade in, in half to get the same drawdown as the S&P that you're comfortable with. You're trading half size to target the same risk with double the return. All right, let's go with Tesla next. Fast moving stock, right? Same, same, same. No optimization, same exact system. 69% with 38%. So we're actually increasing returns, less drawdown. That's eight times what you'd get with the S&P with the same settings with less than two times the drawdown. That means you could get half, trade half the size for four times the return and less drawdown, not the same drawdown, but less drawdown. Well, let's look at Shopify. If same, same, same settings, all right? You see I emphasize that? No optimization, it's not the, the 52 buy and the 47, and we're gonna use the, the 46 minute chart. No, no, no. I'm just gonna take the same results and go across the board here. 110% with 20% drawdown. Now we're talking, now we found something fun. All right, 11 times the return with the same drawdown. Get that? 11 times the return with the same drawdown. So let's put it another way. Let's say you don't need to try to make 100%. Let's say you're happy to get 20%. You could cut the trade down to a fraction of your total risk that you'd have to put into the S&P 
to target high returns. All right, fast moving stocks. But I understand a lot of you are gonna are feeling like, yeah, yeah, that's great, that's great. But I don't feel comfortable picking stocks. All right, I got good news for you. First of all, I have multiple <laughs> bits of good news, but we're gonna start with this one. Here's one that's not a stock. All this is is the inverse volatility ETF. The S VIXI is a ETF that tracks the implied volatility of the S&P 500 and it's inverse okay and guess what we're gonna do you knew it you knew it you know the trend you're a trend follower right same settings <laughs> no, same settings where are we at 47 percent a year with a 30 percent max drawdown and that's five times the return of the s p 500 by this is a derivative of that market but it's a faster moving asset faster moving assets can generate the higher returns five times the return of the S&P 500 version of this with one and a half times the drawdown. All right. So what, let's say you don't even, you, you try that one or that one doesn't work, or you do try to pick stocks and, because you want to get the even higher returns. And what if it just doesn't work? What if you're just terrible at picking stocks? I think we should cover that. Should we just only pick what's worked recently? Well, what if you pick the wrong ones? Let's, let's actually have you walk away from watching this with some confidence that you can make it even if you do pick the wrong stocks because I can't I can't say just because the last 10 years these great stocks would have worked for you I, that doesn't tell you anything about the next 10 years all right so what if you do pick bad stocks well let's just give an example of a bad stock by the way most people won't do this most people telling you about indicators and systems and strategies they're not going to purposefully go find the absolute worst example and then show it to you and then mix it into the results and say, yeah, we have to plan for something like this to happen. I think you should feel a sense of relief that we're covering this. All right. I like to cover downside. I told you that earlier. Let's cover the downside so we know what the downside is. Then if we know the downside, we can appropriately plan for the upside also. In 2011, Groupon IPO'd at a price split adjusted. They've done several reverse splits since then, but split adjusted their IPO is $550. In 2020, it traded as low as $9.60. Ouch. Ouch. All right, so let's say Groupon IPOs, and you just believe Groupon is the next Apple. It's going to be like a Tesla has been. It's going to be like a Shopify has been. It's going to be one of these tech companies massively shifting the industry. Everything about it just screams this is the greatest opportunity. And you just believe it's going to go up. And if you follow signals, you'll be able to capitalize on that very well. Sounds reasonable, right? Well, in hindsight, we know it wouldn't. So wouldn't it be smart for me just to kick that out and not show that to you? No, no, we're going to show it to you. So what if you believed Groupon would go up? So you traded signals on it. After that, I want to make sure you don't forget. I'm going to show you how to be consistent. We're talking about high returns. Then we're going to talk about consistent returns. High, then consistent. Okay. Groupon. Yeah, it didn't work. Same exact settings. I'm not going to go tweak. If I change the settings, I can force this thing to work and show you profits. How would I know that was going to be the settings, though? That's ridiculous. We're going to keep the same exact settings. You lost a little bit. But guess what? With the stock going from 550 to 9, your returns using a good strategy were only minus 4% a year. That's only $2,800. You saw those other ones? We're up on compounded returns, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, okay, $2,800. This is good news. I'm sure I'm trying to go and find and say, I love grabbing Groupon. I say, I need to make sure this thing can survive if I'm just absolutely wrong and I put this in the wrong place at the wrong time. I love, Gr Groupon's like my go-to. I say, let's test it on Groupon. Let's run this on Groupon. And then it comes back with something like that. I'm thrilled. I don't think it should make money on it. I could flip it around, make it go short, and show you all sorts of profit. No, I'm going to try to buy it because it's a fast-moving stock. It's a high beta. Stock is what we call that. And it didn't work, but it didn't work very under control. Awesome news. You could pick eight of those, eight of those, and just one apple. All right? So say you, you go on from here forward, say, hey, nice to meet you. You're going to go on and do this from now on. And you select nine stocks to trade. And eight of them are as terrible as Groupon has been. And one of them is as good as Apple has been. You'd still be profitable. Isn't that wild? 
That's how under control that is. You could pick 40 of those. Let's say you, you just are really, really bad at this. You pick 40 Groupons of the future and just one Shopify. You'd still be profitable. That's because a good strategy keeps your risk low while maximizing your wins. A good strategy will force you to isolate and limit your risk while compounding and reinvesting and maximizing your gains. And it will catch large moves and ride it all the way. And it will get out when it's not working. A lot of the reason why Groupon's so under control is when it's tanking, you're not in. And when it tries to go up, you get whipsawed and you lose a little bit, or sometimes you catch one of those spikes that does generate a profit. Great. But most of the time, there's just fewer trades. You're just not in very much. And when those ones are just flying and flying and flying, you are in. You're in them while they're moving. It's awesome stuff. All right. So now, as I promised, we talked about higher returns. Now we're going to talk about more consistent returns. So the number one way for you to be more consistently profitable using RSI, here's the key, without knowing which asset will do the best in the future. All right. Then finally, right after that, <clears throat> I'll talk to you about how to overcome the biggest challenge that will come with trading RSI so you can turn all of this theory that we've talked about into real world profits. Okay. So the number one way for more consistent, consistent, profitable results, not just high results, but consistent results is a question for you. Haha. <laughs> gotcha. No, I'm going to ask you a question because if I lead with a question, it's going to really help you understand this. Did you notice that all the equity curves we looked at were different? Did you notice they didn't have the same exact shape to them? They had a different shape. All right. So what I'm going to tell you is the most consistently profitable results come from the fact that you need to have multiple assets that earn you money. This is, by the way, a screenshot time. This is when you take a picture of the screen. You write this down. All right. I'm going to show you. <clears throat> you need to have multiple assets that earn you money over time and at different times. Okay. So I'm going to leave that up for a second. You can take a picture of it. You can take a screenshot. Let this one, let this be a massive takeaway for you. To have consistently profitable results, you need to have multiple assets that earn you money over time and at different times. Over time means three, five years from now, it made money. Okay. At some point, it got you to profits and it may not have been every day or every week or every month or even every year, but it made money over time and that you had many different things over that three to five years and different ones made different profits at different times. And that's important because sometimes things aren't just, they're just not going to work. But if you have enough things that can make money over time, something will work. And when something's down, something will be up. And when the thing that was up today is down next month, something else can be up. And let me show you. All right. The reality is since we can't know if Groupon will do better than Tesla, is anybody willing to accept that? I can show you the data that Tesla is so much better. So see, oh, you just know that you should do this on Tesla, not Groupon. Uh, you don't know that. I don't know that. Let's stop pretending that we know that. All right. Is that refreshing? We won't know that. But there's a solution. We can't just study Tesla and ignore Groupon. We can't do that. That's ridiculous. You'd live in a fantasy world of saying, well, I've since I know that did better in the past, I'll just look at that you're it's delusional you cannot do that and that's past tense and we don't know if tesla will continue to do great we don't know if it's going to continue to be the one that's profitable so i can't just point to what happened to work the last 10 years and think somehow that allows us to point to the next 10 years we just can't do it this is a huge problem and most trading gurus ignore it they either ignore it because they don't know what to do with it or they don't even know it's a problem and they instead will just cherry pick the best examples using the convenience of hindsight. Well, I'm going to use the inconvenience of the hindsight of what hasn't worked. And I'm going to force that to be a part of the results because I think it's that important because we won't know what works best in the future. What I will show you next is the results if you didn't use hindsight and you used all of the assets that we discussed, including the bad ones. All right. 
So this is the portfolio return of all six assets that we talked about, all six using RSI, using the same settings over the last 10 years. Same exact rules, except we're using all of the markets, S&P, Groupon, Tesla, Apple, Shop, and SVIXI. Same settings, penny slippage is on everything but SPX. There's almost no difference if you add penny slippage to SPX, but a little bit. The annualized return compounded is 50 one percent and the max drawdown is 26 well maybe you had don't quite remember what we talked about what the levels were before so i will tell you all right that is better and i'll actually give it to you in a second all right it's common to believe that blending six markets together this is where the misconception would normally happen why you would avoid it and try to pick the best it's common to believe that blending six markets together will just give you the average of the six doesn't that make sense isn't that logical i think it's logical that's just something that would click in your head and make sense. If I just do all six, I'll just get the average of all six, right? But it's much better than that. The results are not that. The return versus the drawdown, which is the most important part. I've said it once. I've said it twice. I'll say it again. You can't look at returns without looking at drawdown. You can't look at great results without looking at bad results. You can't look at stocks that went up 400, 500,000 percent unless you also look at one that went down from 500 to nine and see what happens with that. You have to look at the downside. The return versus the drawdown was better than every individual asset except for one. One of them, one of the individual names beat out the total portfolio. The return versus drawdown, or one way to say it is the return on drawdown. Okay. So if you're worried, like I asked you before, that you're worried that you're not a good stock picker, if you're worried that you can't pick one of the top two performance, if I said here are six markets and you're it it depends on you to pick which one is gonna which of the which of these or these two of the six will do the best out of all the rest. If you don't think you can do that, you don't have to. The portfolio can give you the same result without predicting which one will do best. The portfolio will do it for you. So finally, as I promised, how to overcome the biggest challenge with trading RSI so you can actually turn the theory, this great theory, into real world profits. And I've done it before personally. I've helped other people do it. And I want to show you how to do it too. Do you believe that using good signals on faster moving assets can make you more profitable? <clears throat> we talked about a good signal, RSI, shows you when there's more strength than weakness. And that as soon as it shifts into the right balance of strength, you follow that until it loses that strength. That's good. It works on many different assets and many different time frames. So do you believe that doing that on things that move faster and you do that will make you more profitable than just doing it on, on a stock? I think we've proven that's true. Do you also believe that following the rules every time is important for getting the results of the strategy? That you can't just say, well, this week I'll follow at RSI, next week I won't. Or I'll do it until it's losing a little bit of money, then I'll stop. Because if you do that, you're going to miss out on the profits that come shortly after that most of the time. So do you believe that following it every time is important? I think you would agree. Do you believe that as we talked about that diversifying to 5, 10, or even 30 different markets can help you be more consistent? Because different things will make money at different times. Well, if you followed just five strategies on intraday charts, as we discussed, faster moving stocks, at least five of them for the diversification, and on about an hourly time frame, you would have nearly a full time job keeping up with it. Because every hour you'd have to go look at five. Most people don't can't do anything consistently every hour. You, you ever try to drink water every hour? That's good for you, right? You know, it's good for you. And maybe you struggled to do that. Well, it gets tedious after a while checking every chart every hour to see whether or not you need to do anything and having to look at and stare at your p l changing you can see big profits accumulating and want to close them early you can see losses starting and want to close it early you can see losses 
uh, accumulating that need to be closed out and just know in your gut that it's going to turn around. You can get a better price and, and lower that loss. Could you do that every hour on at least five assets? How long would you do it for? Can you reliably take every one of these trades on time, every time, exactly as planned, without interruptions, shiny objects, being distracted, second guessing? Well, 99% of traders are not able to do it. I'm not able to do it. I've tried. But there is a solution that you can follow multiple markets strictly and consistently to get the results that are possible if they occur. And that is fully automated trading. You can go from what probably is your past experience of inconsistent manual trading to running a fully automated portfolio of high performance trading systems. And you can have strategies like the RSI system that we've been talking about running on full autopilot, even if you have no prior experience with automation, coding, programming, anything. And you can learn all of it in about four weeks if you spend about an hour and a half a day working on it. And that assumes you do have some knowledge about markets. If this is your first time ever trading, probably would take you more time than that. But if you have experience with trading, you have experience doing manual trading, and you want to convert it to automation, I've been able to do that for myself and others in about a four-week period of time with only about an hour and a half a day committed to it. And even better, I'm willing to and doing this for qualified traders, I'll put 10000 into a funded account so you can start fully automated trading right away. Every one of those graphs I showed you, all of those returns and those compounded growths you saw over 10 years that led to tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars began with $10,000. All right. So if you're interested in that, you want to learn the RSI system, you want to learn how to apply it to faster moving stocks, you want to learn how to apply it to a large basket of diversified instruments so you can have more consistent results, and you want to learn how to be very consistent with it by using automation, then I have a presentation for you that you can watch totally free that will explain to you the importance of automation and how you can learn how to do it in about 28 days. All right, and you can get to that at learn automatedtrading.com. All right, so go to that website if you want to check that out. But as a review of what we talked about, I told you today I would show you an RSA strategy that was profitable over 50 years. We talked about that. That was on the S&P 500 on the daily chart. Didn't make a lot. So we went ahead and looked at the shorter time frames. And then we saw that with all available data, intraday data, we only get 30 years of data, just too much data for all the databases. So we get 30 years and everything that we studied over the full length of intraday data, profitable more profitable actually to the point of beating the market and then we looked at faster moving stocks and we saw multiples of returns with controlled risk and then we even put it into a bad stock and it barely lost anything and then we portfolioed the whole thing and instead of trying to pick which one or two would be the best we took the whole basket including the the big index including the one that didn't work including the lower performer of the svixi the three lower performers with three high performers, we put them all together and we got a result that was almost as good as the best one. Definitely above even the second one. That's what I showed you today, all using the RSI indicator. And it's one of multiple strategies that I teach to the clients that choose to learn with me automated trading. So if you want to learn about that, like I said, totally free presentation. You can dive deeper into fully automated trading, learn how you can do that at learnautomatedtrading.com. I thank you so much for hanging out with me, checking all this out. I hope you found it very valuable. If you're watching this on YouTube or social media anywhere, please go ahead and like it, comment, subscribe, and set alerts, and make sure that you're prepared for when I release another video, and we'll get into some other trading concepts, including options, futures, stocks, automation, portfolios, investments, etc. All right, awesome, thanks for being here and I'll see you next time.